Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Paleocrat Diaries on the meaning of Catholic. I'm your host for part 10 of the Ecumenical Councils. Feels good. We've made it. I'm sorry I wasn't with you on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday for that matter. Kind of dropped all ball a little bit on my end. Nonetheless, here we are. It's Friday. I stole the Paleocrat's time slot. And we're going to discuss the lead up to the Council of Chalcedon. But before we do, I wanted to mention, I've been a little remiss about this the past several episodes. You should support this channel. If you like what I do, if you like what Tim does, and Kennedy, and Jeremiah, and Luis, if you enjoy the content that we produce, then consider donating to one of their Patreons. I don't have a Patreon. So you can give your money that you would give to me to them. Uh, You could buy Tim's book. You could buy Kennedy's book. You could buy Jeremiah's book when it comes out. That's the reason he's not here, by the way. He's got to finish that thing up. Nonetheless, uh, what what did I miss? Oh, yeah, like, subscribe, share, comment, do all the things. It helps us. It helps us stay at the top of everybody's YouTube feed so we can bring this kind of thing to everyone else for free. All right, I think I've said what I need to say. So here we go, the Ecumenical Councils, part 10. We're looking at the years, we're gonna go probably from like 520 up to, I'm hoping, right before Constantinople II, which occurred in 553. So that's my goal, 33 years in one shot. Let's see if it can be done. All right, there we go. There we go. Outline. Got some tea this evening. Celebrating my English heritage. Hat tip to our librarian. Okay, where do we leave off? I believe we were speaking about Justinian and his replacements of the people in power, uh, the patriarchs when they died. He would bring some new guys in and... Uh, If I recall correctly, let me just check my outline. Mm, Yeah, that's right. Timothy III is the reigning Monophysite patriarch of Alexandria, and the emperor just kind of let this happen, right? So here we are. We're in the early 520s, and in the midst of the Monophysite controversy, you have a couple of other things that sort of pop up because of it. I mean, they're directly caused by it. The first thing that I'd like to mention is the so-called Theopascite formula. This was an attempt at reconciliation with the Monophysites. What this basically boils down to is there was a group of monks, the Scythian monks, and they proceeded to, to sort of promote this formula, if you will. There's really no other way to say it. One of the Trinity suffered in the flesh for us, us meaning us men. One of the Trinity suffered in the flesh for us. And again, this is an attempt at reconciling Chalcedonians and Monophysites. Why would this reconcile? Well, this would require a human nature to be united to a divine person in such a way that the suffering could be predicated of the divine person. So this would placate the Monophysites because it would emphasize, without really having to say it, but the the, the conclusion naturally is, the hypostatic union is straight to the fore of this formula. So Cyril would be proud, I think. And it would hedge our, our bets against the Nestorians because they would never dare to say that the son suffered in the same way the man Jesus suffered, what would they say instead? They would say the prosopon of union suffered, right? That Christ suffered, but not the Son or the Word proper. So this Theopascite formula, with Theo, God, and Pascite is the root for suffering. So this, this formula that declares that one of the Trinity suffered, that God suffered for us, This is 
a pretty clever attempt, I have to be honest, to harmonize Leo and Cyril and to sort of flush out the crypto Nestorians. If somebody denied this formula, then there was a strong possibility that they held Nestorian tendencies. These monks, they tried to go to Rome. They did go to Rome. They tried to sway Pope Hormizdas. They tried to persuade him that their formula, that this was it. And they had the support of the emperor. But the Pope sort of just said, nah, I don't know about all that. You just leave me alone. And he just sort of just dismissed them. Now, this caused a bit of a ruckus. And this, this led to the monks accusing the papal legates and, and insinuating even that Hormizdas himself were Nestorians. They were heretics. They wrote a violent letter to Hormizdas explaining exactly what they thought about him. But the furor faded over time. Everything calmed down. And the monks just sort of quietly went away. They were supported by Justinian, the emperor's nephew, after all. So that's the first thing. The second thing is a funny Greek word, aphthartodocetism. So there was this question that arose amongst the Monophysites. It was sort of an internal struggle. Was the body of Christ by nature corruptible? Severus of Antioch, the brain trust of the Monophysite program, he says, yes, the body of Christ is naturally corruptible because, after all, it was a true human body. Julian of Halicarnassus, another leading Monophysite, he says no. Julian was so far committed to the Monophysite program that to him, one nature meant that there's really no room for ascribing human acts to the Son. Christ suffered, but only because he willed it not because this was possible to him by nature. So we have um, not quite a schism, but sort of. You could think of it as definitely an internal division between parties within monophysitism. You have the Julianists and the Severans. Now, related to this is a, a sort of a sub-point. The Agnoete, these are the ones, um, they say, Christ didn't have knowledge. Severus's followers, they took his meaning a little too far. Remember, Severus, he wants to say that the body of Christ is corruptible because it's a true human body. Uh, it's subject to the same limitations that our human natures are subject to, with some notable exceptions, right? We, we can't walk on water, obviously. But these agnoete, they wanted to say that Christ was subject to the same level of ignorance as other men, despite being divine. They're saying Christ is not, in fact, all-knowing because of his limited human nature. Now, these theories, the aphthartodocetism and the agnoete, they're clearly incorrect. One could say heretical, even. But this is what happens. This is a function of taking a heresy and running with it, making your, your foundation, your platform erroneous. All the conclusions you draw from it will also be erroneous. And some of these are truly absurd. So we have, uh, if I could just you know paint a, a picture, perhaps, we have roughly four camps that are rivaling with one another at this time. You have the Chalcedonians, who affirm Chalcedon, but they tend toward Nestorianism. These are the guys kind of on the edge. They really like Chalcedon. They really like Leo's tome. They're really big on two natures. And they're sort of borderline heretics in the wrong direction, as if heresy has a right direction. An example of this would be the sleepless monks, uh, these were monks in Constantinople, very fanatical, and they were exceedingly firm Chalcedonians. So then you had the second group, the Neo-Chalcedonians. 
They want to reconcile with the Monophysites, but they want to maintain the integrity of the Council of Chalcedon. This would be somebody like uh, Justinian, the emperor's nephew, and Pope Hormizdas. They're open to reconciliation. They see the good in that. They want to bring back their separated brethren, if you will, and they want to maintain the Orthodox faith. If I were living back then, I would hope that I was in that group because that seems to me to be the group to be in. The one who wants to toe the line, believe the faith, not compromise, but at the same time, be welcoming, be reconciling. Okay. Thirdly, we have what we could call the moderate Monophysites. They reject Chalcedon, but they really don't want to go too far. They recognize the dangers of going off the deep end. So here we have an example would be Severus or Timothy the Third. They're more moderate, and they're criticized for being moderate, I might add. And then last but not least, you have the extreme Monophysites. These are the ones who reject Chalcedon as Nestorian and don't seem to care how far they go. Julian of Halicarnassus and the Agnoetes. Their doctrines led them down any manner of, of rabbit holes, and they just didn't care because they were so sure that the foundation they were building upon was correct in the first place. Now, I, I do want to add this. It's somewhat difficult to classify each and every person because the, the viewpoints are so varied. So I'm not going to try to put everybody into one of these four categories. Suffice it to say that these are roughly the four general trends that we're going to encounter in this time period. In 527, the emperor Justin dies, and Justinian, his nephew, naturally comes to power. He's called the Great, and he reigned for 38 years, from 527 to 565. Shortly before Justin's death, he actually crowned Justinian, so he, he made sure to name his successor and gave him the throne a few months before he perished, he and his wife, whose name was Theodora. Justinian was 45 at the time, and he was a committed Orthodox Catholic. He was a Latin, just like his uncle. Theodora, on the other hand, was a Monophysite. She was the daughter of, I believe, a circus bear trainer, and she had spent some time as a lady of the night. So, without getting too far into how her and Justinian probably met, Let's just say when they met, they fell madly in love with one another, and they never parted, right? They never betrayed or abandoned one another, at least so it seems. Justinian, when he took the throne, he had, I mean, it seems like he had pretty grand visions for the Roman Empire. He wanted to reconcile the Monophysites. He wanted to reconquer the Italian peninsula, in portions of what was Roman Africa. He wanted to revamp the code of law. And last but not least, perhaps his greatest achievement, promoting Byzantine art and architecture, just culture in general. A few years into his reign, 533, there were some riots in the capital. He was threatened. Uh, the, the people were kind of closing in on him. And at the time, it seemed like Justinian was full of cowardice. His wife, Theodora, she rose to the challenge. She emboldened him. She strengthened him. She says, well, you can go. Uh, you can flee. He was about to, to leave town, I suppose. She says, you know, I'd rather die the empress than flee and be overthrown. And seeing his wife's resolve, Justinian, he's empowered. He, he, he quells the riots. He firmly regains control. And I think that was a lesson for him. That was a moment where he realized he could draw strength from this woman, right? regardless of where she's been. Look where she is now. Empowering the emperor must have felt pretty good. After the riots had been put down and the guilty parties punished, I'm sure, Justinian set about with his first goal, reconciling the Catholics and the Monophysites. So he calls, uh, not a council, but 
a meeting, a committee, right? Six Catholics and six Monophysites. And the purpose is to bring these two sides to the table and to have a theological discussion and try to see what can we get out of this? Where can we go? The negotiations broke down, however. The Monophysites didn't want to compromise on the restoration of Theodoret of Cyrus and Ebus of Edessa. These were those two Antiochian theologians I had previously mentioned who were, at Chalcedon, declared to be personally orthodox. The Monophysites were not okay with this. On the other side of the table, the Catholics didn't want to accept the Theopascite formula. Justinian was pushing this pretty hard. They didn't want to have to say, one of the Trinity suffered in the flesh for us. And they remembered those aggressive Scythian monks with their nasty letter to Pope Hormistus. It was sort of a turnoff to the whole thing. Well, Justinian, he was convinced that the Theopascite formula was the way to get the heretics back, right? In fact, I, I don't even, I, I can't really say that he believed they were heretics. I think he truly believed they were trying to be faithful sons of the church, at least at first. He wanted to be very conciliatory, and his behavior evidences that, because even in opposition to his six Catholic theologians, he wants to push this formula, right? And maybe we should take a minute and, and examine it. One of the Trinity suffered in the flesh for us. What's wrong with that? Isn't uh, God the Son, one of the Trinity? Yes. Did he not become man in the womb of the Virgin? Yes. Did not this same God-man suffer in the flesh on the cross? Yes. The formula is perfectly orthodox. There's nothing wrong with it at all. It was maybe the manner about which the Scythian monks went about it, trying to push it on to the Pope, who was weary of Monophysites. He had just fought with one to regain communion with Constantinople. And now here they come and they want to reconcile with these guys? Come on, get out of here. So the emperor, Justinian, he loves the formula. And he promulgates two decrees, two edicts, making this the official religious policy of the Roman Empire. And he expects all of the bishops to sign it. The sleepless monks, the ones I mentioned uh, a little while ago, they refused to accept it, and there was some pushback from others too. Justinian sent the formula to the man who was now Pope, a man named John II. John II approved it. The monks, the sleepless monks, not the Scythian monks, the sleepless monks, they were recalcitrant. They denounced the Pope as a heretic. He's an historian. So... John condemned them. Isn't that what happens? You take a good thing, you take it too far, right? The sleepless monks, they wanted to uphold the Council of Chalcedon. They were in favor of an ecumenical council. They were abiding by tradition, if you will. And here comes this pope, and he's about to sign off. John II's about to sign off on a new formula. Oh, new we can't have that. We don't do new when you're Catholic, except it was entirely orthodox. But they, they just wouldn't give in. And they refused to submit to their lawful superior. So they were condemned. Scrolling down. <clears throat> Around this time, the patriarchs of Alexandria... And Constantinople both died, and they too were replaced with Monophysite bishops. I've already mentioned, uh, no, excuse me, I have not mentioned. Anthemus is the man's name who replaces Timothy III at Constantinople, and a bishop named Theodosius is appointed at Alexandria. This is through the scheming of a certain empress, Theodora. And recall, Justinian is initially very conciliatory toward the Monophysites. 
But pretty soon, within a few years, it's going to become the official policy of the empire to expel them. In 536, after these patriarchs have been at it for a short time, an unlikely guest arrives in Constantinople. It's the Pope. It's not John II. It's his successor, Agapitus. Agapitus was sent there on an errand by the king of the Ostrogoths, a man named Theodahad, or Theodatus is another way to say it. I'll stick with Theodatus. That's easier. The purpose of his diplomatic mission was twofold. Theodahad, excuse me, Theodatus, sent the Pope for two reasons. He says, number one, try to get Justinian not to reconquer the Italian peninsula because we kind of live here and we don't want to die. So that'd be great if he could not. And number two, please ask him to leave the Arians alone. Arians? We're 200 years after Nicaea. There are still Arians. There are Arians mingled and mixed in with the barbarian tribes, and the Ostrogoths would be one of them. They were evangelized, if you will, or misevangelized by a certain Ulfilas, a bishop who was Arian, and he didn't quite get the memo about Nicaea I and Constantinople I. He probably didn't know about any of that stuff. He was just out there preaching and teaching the gospel as he knew it, as he believed it. And so, having received the faith from this man, or they believed they had received the faith from this man, many of the barbarians were actually Arian. So here we are, the Ostrogoths in the 530s, still practicing Arianism, even though it's been condemned. And Theodotus sent the Pope to ask the emperor to please stop persecuting us, please stop seizing our churches and killing us when we don't want to convert. Thanks. Now, to be fair, Agapitus was not really concerned with Theodotus's errands as much as he was the religious controversy raging in the church at the time. He did mention it. Hey, can you please stop persecuting the Arians? Would you mind not reconquering the Italian peninsula? But Justinian said, mm, no. The conquest went on. And, well, the emperor did give in on one point with the Arians. He said, look, um, we'll give you back some of your churches. But if an Arian had converted to Catholicism, they're not allowed to convert back. And if they do, they're subject to penalty. But you can have some of your stuff back. And that was about as far as Theodotus got with Justinian. Now, for Agapitus's part, like I mentioned, he was much more concerned with the problems facing the church, the monophysites that just won't go away. He refuses communion with Anthemus, and Justinian gets mad. You mean you don't want to hold communion with the, wife, the, the bishop that my wife chose? What's the matter with you? Now I'm upset with you, Pope. Well, Agapitus says to Justinian, well, bring your man here. Let him confess two natures in Christ. So Justinian summoned him, and Anthemus would not do it. And finally, Justinian realized, oh, this is not the guy I thought he was. He's a heretic. So Agapitus deposes Anthemus and installs in his place a new patriarch, Menas. Menas is orthodox. He's vetted by the Pope. After that, they planned some talks, more talks, you know, dialogue, encounter, that kind of thing. More talks planned for how exactly are we going to expel the Monophysites from the capital? Sadly, Agapitus dies in April of 536, before this meeting could take place. Word got back to Rome and they quickly had a conclave and elected Silverius, who was the son of Pope Hormistus. Now, at this point, we have to introduce Vigilius. If you've ever watched Catholic YouTube, 
Um, for example, Reason and Theology or Pints with Aquinas or any other show like that, you may have come across Vigilius before. So much of what I say probably will not be new. Nonetheless, Vigilius is a Roman deacon. He's from a noble family, and he's well known in noble circles. Uh, he's well known in ecclesiastical circles. He's known for mm, being one of those kind of cutthroat guys who wants what he wants when he wants it, and he's not above doing some underhanded things to get what he desires. Vigilius, I mentioned he was a deacon, he was in the entourage sent by Theodatus, king of the Ostrogoths, to Justinian. He was with the Pope when Anthemus was deposed. He was probably with the Pope when he died. And as a matter of fact, there's a little suspicion surrounding the death of Agapitus. Very sudden, very unusual. He seemed like he was fine, and then now he's dead. It was at this visit, probably before the Pope's death, for reasons I'll explain in a moment, that this Vigilius had a meeting with Theodora. You see, several years prior, he was in line to be Pope. One of the Popes, uh, Boniface II, he wanted to kind of change the rules. You see, when a pope died, there would be this power struggle. There would be money and pressure and influence and propaganda and all these things to elect a successor. And Boniface II, he did not like that. He thought this is not fitting for the successor of Peter. So he changed the rules, right? Popes can do that. They can change the manner in which their successor is going to be elevated. Boniface II said, you know what? The sitting pontiff before he dies has to designate his successor. The man that Boniface designated was Vigilius. This was years prior. When some other clerics and important Roman families got word of this, they said, mm -mm -mm, you're not doing that. You're going to leave us with this guy? And so Boniface had to undo it. And Vigilius had to relinquish his future claim to the papacy. He was this close. Everyone knew how badly he wanted to be Pope. And everyone feared, what might he do to achieve that? So here we are. Vigilius, the deacon, is with Agapitus in Constantinople. And Theodora and her monophysites, mm, things just aren't going so well. Her main guy in Constantinople was just deposed because he's been exposed. Deposed because you got exposed. So she has a meeting with Vigilius. And word on the street is that she promises him, I will make you Pope. I will pay you money. But you have to do as I ask. What does she want? She wants Anthemus restored, and she wants the Monophysite heresy to become the new orthodoxy. Right? And then suddenly, Agapitus dies. Strange. So here we go. We don't have a pope. At least in Constantinople, they didn't think that they did. But you have to know... As soon as Agapitus died, word went back to Rome. How else could they elect Silverius so quickly? Vigilius probably accompanied the body of the dead pope back to Rome to be buried. And it probably arrived sometime in late summer or early fall. This was too slow. He wanted to be elected pope. Vigilius was going to insert himself into the proceedings. But Silverius was already there. Now, this was the time when the reconquest of the Italian peninsula was in full swing. And it was under the able hands, or in the able hands, I should say, 
of General Belisarius, by all accounts a very good man. Belisarius was Justinian's most able military commander, and he receives word from Theodora that Silverius needs to come to Constantinople. She says, bring him to me at all costs. Belisarius then invites Silverius to dinner. How pleasant. You have to imagine, Silverius probably saw the writing on the wall. He arrives at the residence of Belisarius, a palace whose name I forget. And as soon as he steps in, a deacon meets him at the door and removes his pallium. Then he's led further into the chamber where Belisarius and his wife are waiting. Vigilius was probably there also. It's at this point that Silverius is charged with treason. Treason? Why treason? Where did this come from? Well, when Silverius was elected, he was the candidate supported by the Ostrogoths. And these were the enemies of the Byzantines. Who are they reconquering the Italian peninsula from? The Goths. So if the Goths support Silverius and you got elected Pope, you must be a traitor. Belisarius has Silverius stripped of his garments and rushed to a ship that's been waiting. And off you go into exile. And the next day, he tells everyone in Rome, you know, wouldn't you know it, the Pope resigned. He wanted to go be a hermit. <laughs> We're going to have to have a new Pope. Hey, how about that guy, Vigilius? Pretty good. So Varius was taken to Patara, a lonely town on the southern coast of Asia Minor, the coast of the Mediterranean, sort of a rocky uh, area. Not very pleasant, no beaches to speak of. And Vigilius is proclaimed Pope. This is all in 537. The people of Rome, again, were told that Silverius just wanted to resign. And so it seems, at least at first, that they accepted this. Now, when Silverius reached exile, the bishop there, like, who are you? Oh, I'm Silverius, Pope of Rome. Hi, nice to meet you. The bishop took him in. The people were outraged. And he personally, the bishop, I mean, goes to see Justinian. He goes to the emperor. Now, this is the bishop of some backwater town. In fact, we don't even know his name. It's been lost to history. But he goes to Justinian and he says, there are many kings, many kings, but there's only one pope. And you can't treat him like this. And Justinian is persuaded by this. I think he realizes his mistake. He allowed it after all. So he has Silverius sent back to Rome to be tried. If there was a trial when Silverius reached Rome, it surely wasn't a fair one, and he lost. And then he was taken to a tiny little island off the coast of Sicily called Palmaria. He died that next year in the summer, 538. He died of starvation. Vigilius now is not anti-pope, but pope. I believe it was June 20th, 538. And I believe that that is the liturgical celebration of Pope Silverius, martyr. Let's hop back a few years to 531. There is an outcry from Palestine, from some monks, regarding Origen. Origen was a theologian, um, not exactly a church father, but sort of. He's not canonized uh, for reasons that will become clear. He's a very brilliant theologian, got some things wrong, but pretty good. And there's 
sort of a revival in Origen's thought. We could call it Originism. There's a revival in Originism, and it's causing some problems. The Palestinian monks see a lot of issues, and they complain. They complain to Pelagius, who is papal representative in Constantinople. Uh, Pelagius was the, the deacon. Uh, his official title is Apocrisiarius. He was he was Apocrisiarius under Agapitus and Silverius. And he, to be honest, he continued under Vigilius as well. But here we are in 531, gone back a few years. Pelagius then takes it upon himself to condemn Originism and depose and or exile whoever will not recant it, whoever won't let it go. This causes a stir among many influential figures, one of them being a certain Theodore Asketas. Theodore was a court advisor and a capable theologian. In fact, he ended up being Justinian's principal theological advisor. This Theodore had Monophysite tendencies, but he hid it from Justinian. And apparently he also appreciated the theology of origin. Like I said, there's a lot there to like. Some things he got wrong, but still. When Originism is condemned in the early 530s, Theodore swallows his pride he signs off on it. He doesn't want to be deposed. He wants to stay at court in Constantinople. He wants to remain Justinian's theological advisor. And so you have to go along with what the papal ambassador says, at least for now. This Theodore, he's cunning. He says, you know, your highness, I bet there's a way you can reconcile these Monophysites without the Theopascite formula. So you could win them back, as it were, without upsetting the West. All you have to do is condemn a couple of Nestorian theologians, a few Antiochenes, perhaps. Who is Theodore referring to? Well, it's these three guys. Theodore of Mopsuestia, Theodoret of Cyrus, and Ibas of Edessa. These were, in Theodore Askidas' mind, notorious Nestorians. Theodore of Mopsuestia was Nestorius' mentor. Remember, he died in 428 in full communion with the church. Theodoret, bishop of Cyrus, had Nestorian sympathies, but again, this was one of the ones personally declared to be personally orthodox at the Council of Chalcedon. Ebas, the same way. Nestorian sympathies, tendencies, maybe some Nestorian writings even, but declared personally orthodox by Chalcedon. Theodorus Gidas proposes to Justinian, look, you got to condemn these guys. Condemn the person and writings of Theodore of Mopsuestia and the writings of the other two. That will show the Monophysites that they have nothing to fear from Nestorian theologians. That will win them back. Now, these writings were organized into one easy uh, document, if you will, the three capitula, or the three chapters. And that's how it comes down to us ever since in English, the three, three chapters controversy. All right, leaping back forward through time, in 543, Justinian promulgates an edict as law and sends it around for ecclesiastical approval. He condemns the three chapters, and he wants all of the bishops to do the same. Remember, he's real big on reconciling Monophysites. Menas of Constantinople, the man installed by Agapitus himself, he signs it, but only conditionally. He wants to know what Vigilius thinks. He says, look, I'll go ahead and sign this, but you're sending this to the Pope, right? If he doesn't like it, I don't like it. If he's okay with it, I'm okay with it. Others in the East did the same, conditional signatures. They want to hear from Rome. So, naturally, when it reaches Rome, all eyes are on the Apostolic See. The approval did not come. 
And it should be noted at this point, we are six years in to Vigilius's legitimate papacy, excuse me, five years in. 538, he was no longer anti-pope, but true pope. Five years in to Vigilius's papacy, and he has not fulfilled his promise to Theodora, the empress. Vigilius hesitates to sign this new edict that Justinian has sent around. Justinian is pretty enraged by this. And so he does what enraged emperors sometimes do. They send soldiers to kidnap the Pope. He had Vigilius captured and taken to Sicily, but he rather unwisely left him there for about 10 months. During this time, Vigilius uses his writing capabilities he uses his deacons back in Rome to stir up opposition to the edict among the West, particularly in Roman Africa. Now, Roman Africa has been freshly reconquered by Belisarius, the very able general. And so now the Byzantines are back in town. Now they're in charge. And oh, by the way, sign this condemnation of, of three theologians who died in communion with the church. Hmm? The Africans are not interested. They were warned of it by the Roman deacons, and they were told that this is going to undermine Chalcedon. How so? Well, if these theologians are declared by Chalcedon to be orthodox, but it turns out that they're actually heretics, then the fathers at Chalcedon must be confused about what orthodoxy really is. So we, maybe we can't trust it. Maybe Chalcedon's an Nestorian council. You know that Leo, he didn't say hypostatic union. That's not in the document. There was this talk of two natures. Hmm, it's unseemly. Maybe, you know, maybe we just need to sort of undo Chalcedon, and let's get back to tradition. Let's go back to Ephesus, Cyril, Dioscorus. Let's do that. Why was it even necessary? Hmm. Anyhow, the Africans, they see this coming. They understand this line of reasoning. They understand it to be very dangerous. They don't want to do anything that would tarnish the reputation of the Holy Council. Recall, for most bishops back then, the councils were revered on the same level as the Gospels. They had four holy councils, four holy Gospels. What's that tell us? That they believed that God spoke through the councils. If they revered them as highly as they did the very word of God in the scriptures. It's the Holy Spirit moving through the church, helping them define doctrines, condemn heresies, guiding them to the truth, as our Lord said that he would. Now, particularly effective in this effort to oppose Justinian's edict is a certain Ferrandus of Carthage. He rallies a lot of support, so much so that Zoilus, the patriarch of Alexandria, he signed it, but he recants, and he writes to the Pope apologizing. He says, look, I signed it, but I was under duress. I was being pressured. Now, Menas of Constantinople did the same thing, and I believe the Patriarch of Antioch did the same thing. This angers Justinian. He doesn't like it. He's the emperor. He wants to get his way. I think if I were emperor, I'd want to get my way too. So he has Vigilius taken, finally, after 10 long months, from Sicily to Constantinople. And he's mad. Justinian's mad. Vigilius probably mad, too. Upon his arrival, Justinian receives him with full honors, as would be fitting for the pontiff. However, almost immediately after that, the pressure begins. Justinian is going to try to force Vigilius to condemn the three chapters. 
it was Justinian's idea, and he tried to explain this to Vigilius, that this won't undermine Chalcedon. You're not saying anything about the council. You're simply looking at the writings of these three theologians and then Theodore of Mopsuestia, his person and writings. And you're saying, you know, look, there, there's some Nestorianism here and we condemn that. It's pretty harmless. But Vigilius, eh, I don't know. He sort of wants to hold out. But he could be persuaded. After all, he made a deal with Theodora. In June of 547, Vigilius agrees to condemn the three chapters. And so in the following year, in 548, in the spring, he writes up a document known as the Judicatum. It outlines his condemnation of the three chapters, those three Syrian theologians, but he specifically protects Chalcedon. Now, this Judicatum is widely accepted in the East, widely rejected in the West. So much so that those African bishops from before, they even went so far as to excommunicate Vigilius for, in their mind, abandoning the faith. This fomented a lot of angst in the West, and it really didn't achieve the result that Justinian intended. Vigilius, he pleads with the emperor, look, this has made it worse. Now the East is all about it. The West is, mm, they excommunicated me. It's not really good over there. Can I withdraw the Judicatum and let's, let's have a council? Justinian agrees to this. And so in August of 550, the Judicatum is withdrawn and the plans begin for an ecumenical council. Justinian and Vigilius have both agreed to this. The reasons, well, two reasons. Number one, we have to get universal assent. They see this now as key. We've tried the edicts. We've tried some various theological formulae. We've tried the Pope writing a letter we're just not all on the same page. So we need to get everybody together. We need to discuss it. We need to figure this thing out. And two, the second reason, to make the matter more clear. Councils are usually pretty good at that. The Western bishops were not going to agree to the Judicatum. They were not going to agree to the Theopascite formula. They were not going to agree to any of Justinian's edicts, so to continue to press would have been counterproductive anyway. And if Justinian's goal is to reconcile the Monophysites back to Holy Mother Church, then alienating another portion of that same church would really not achieve what he set out to do. So the council is summoned. Bishops from around the world were invited. Very few from the West made it, but some. Mostly an Eastern Council, just like Constantinople I. Now, this probably should indicate what's about to happen. In the interim, the time between, Justinian has an idea for another edict. He wants to make things clear so that everyone who attends the council knows exactly what is orthodoxy so that when they get there, we can just all kind of sign off on it. So he sends this edict around, but he calls it a confession of faith or a declaration of faith. And the edict is going to lay out the theological problems at stake as far as the emperor sees it and indicate what should be done about them. How kind of him. He's going to tell the bishops what's the problem and how to fix it. And all you have to do is sign here when you show up. It kind of sounds like an edict that he's going to send around. Sort of, sound, sort of sounds like a theological formula. But instead of sending it to them, he's making them come to him just to sign the, the paper. Hmm. Justinian says, look, when the council meets, all you got to do is vote yes, and then y'all can go home. Great. Vigilius strongly opposes this plan. 
In the following August of 551, because of his opposition, there's a riot inside of the Church of St. Peter, where the Pope had sought sanctuary. This was in Constantinople. Police and soldiers attempt to arrest him, but the crowd defends him. And Vigilius apparently was no weakling either. He clung to the pillars around the high altar such that when the soldiers and police officers were trying to pull him away, his muscles didn't give away, but the altar did. And it broke and it nearly crushed him. And finally, a sense of compassion overcame them. He's an old man after all. Let's leave him alone. We have to go now. So the crowd eventually forces the perpetrators out. After this, Vigilius receives word from Justinian that he won't be harmed. He won't be threatened. Nothing of the sort. So he goes home. Now recall, Vigilius has taken very far from home in 545. Home now is the palace of Placidia in Constantinople, which, naturally, is full of spies. He can't live like this. Four months later, around Christmas time in 551, Vigilius makes his escape in the middle of the night. You see, some of his associates, uh, Dacius of Milan being one of them, noticed that there's only one guard on duty tonight, We're getting close to Christmas after all. So he and his entourage, as many of them as were present, escaped through a small hole in the wall. And Vigilius, in one of his later letters, recounts that it was sort of arduous for all of them to get through there. I wonder how big was that hole? How much struggling would he have to have gone through to get his body through there? And I wonder if anybody got stuck like Winnie the Pooh. Hmm. Nonetheless, they clambered over the rooftops and they made their way to the coast where a boat was waiting to take them across the Bosporus to Chalcedon. They took refuge in the church of St. Euphemia where 100 years before Chalcedon was held, the council was held, took shelter in the basilica. And from there, Vigilius worked feverishly against the emperor's confession of faith and uh, Justinian's plans to anathematize the three chapters. He did this by means of what we would probably call an encyclical. It was a constitutum, February of 552. He lays out what is the apostolic faith. For the sake of clarity, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I covered that. Not really an encyclical, but it was a letter. It was meant to be distributed. You get the point. The letter, the constitutum of Vigilius, made no mention of the three chapters, but it explicitly upheld Chalcedon. We can see where Vigilius's mind is. He's very concerned to preserve the ecumenical councils. He doesn't want to have the conversation about the potentially Nestorian theologians. Around this time, Justinian starts to send more police, more soldiers, and arrests are made. He rounds up all those who were with the Pope, including and especially the Apocrisiarius, the legate Pelagius, the deacon. He arrests some other Italian bishops, Dacius of Milan, another, uh, he's a very powerful bishop, being one of them. Some were tortured. Pelagius was thrown into prison, treated harshly. Vigilius, for his part, responds quite manfully. He excommunicates anyone who has signed the latest edict, this confession of faith. He deposed Theodore Askidas, who is really the influence behind all this whole thing. He's hurt. His feelings got hurt because origin. Remember, Pelagius is responding to complaints from Palestinian monks about this originism. They're not really sure what to make of it. This guy says some really, really strange things and... Uh, 
So Pelagius condemns it. Theodora of Asketus is upset. So he's the one that puts the bug in the ear of Justinian. You know, if you just condemn these three chapters, Vigilius excommunicates Theodore, and he sends public notice. Apparently he had a man on the inside posting all these things all around Constantinople so that everybody would know what Justinian was up to and the way the Holy Father was being treated. This caused the silly to rally, city to rally to him once more. Justinian, humiliated, encouraged those who fell under the sentence of excommunication to retract their signatures and enter once more into communion with Vigilius. As a side note, it seems like communion with Rome was important to Justinian. If not, why would he have given in on this point? All of these things that I've just been describing occurred between February and August of 552. We've got to stop here. I was just one year shy of where I wanted to be. We've made it 32 years. Right before Chalcedon, uh, excuse me, Constantinople II is going to convene. Convenes May 5th, 553. So we're right there on the doorsteps. We're in the thick of the controversy over the three chapters. Justinian, the emperor, versus Vigilius, the wicked, saintly, strong and foolish pope strange strange times speaking of strange don't forget if any of you are watching my show and you don't know about this guy right here Monsignor Ronald Knox he wrote a really cool book called Enthusiasm a chapter in the history of religion and my boy Jeremiah he did a 20 part series covering the ins and outs of what Monsignor Knox calls enthusiasms. Worth it. Worth it. All right. I had to throw that in there. Here we go. We're closing it down. I got to go to bed. It's nighttime here. See, my porch light's on. Never give up. Ladies and gentlemen, keep on smiling. And above all, memento mori.